Hello there, welcome to this latest out and about edition of Talking Europe. Now, perhaps you know this saying, it's not easy being green. And that is the question that we're looking at in this programme, specifically in the domain of farming. Now, farming, of course, a massive industry in the European Union and here in Germany. Germany is one of the EU's major agricultural producers. Now, Germany is also a country very much known for its green credentials. A whole wave of green politicians have won support at recent elections here. So as European Union policymakers debate new farming policies due to come in over the next few years, what targets will they be putting in place and how will they intend to achieve them? This all comes, of course, as well at a time when there are added pressures from the coronavirus crisis and with less money to go around in the EU budget. So we'll be looking at all of those themes. We'll get started right here in the countryside near the southwestern city of Stuttgart. Well, the first person we've brought you to meet properly here in Germany is an MEP. She's from the German Green Party and, of course, the Greens Group in the European Parliament, Anna deparney grunenberg Thank you very much for being our guest. Hi. Hi there. Let's take a little walk along this uh, field here, just outside Stuttgart, I ought to say. Um, you are, as I said, a German Green. There have been real wins for German Greens in all kinds of elections recently. Do you feel like your time has come? Yeah, our times has come in the principle that we need to be more ecological and to transform our agriculture or all kind of uh, services. But in fact, in the European Union, we are only 9%. And so it's really difficult to have great majorities to change really the things. Well, this programme, as I said, is about uh, sustainability in farming particularly and uh, what they call greening at the European Union. Just first off, how green would you say German farming is at this point? Not so much <laughs> that maybe people outside of there are thinking. Of course, we have a lot of movement in the uh, biological agriculture and that's great. But we have big, great structures, industrial structures like they're doing like 10, 20 years, the same thing. And it's not so green that people are thinking. Well, the European Union itself, through the Common Agricultural Policy, has been uh, specifically putting measures in place over the last few years in favour of what they call greening uh, through agriculture. Uh, the French Court of Auditors, though, said in just July 2020 that it had great potential, this programme, but really hadn't been a success. There hasn't been much take up. Is it time perhaps to admit defeat on greening? Maybe the, the way they want to, to pay the greening is not the right way, but we have to be more uh, ecological and to see how our weather, weather and uh, uh, changing all processes and we want to have a good soil and water and air for our future generation. So the greening as such is not a defeat, but it hasn't begun really. So I think we have to be better, to be more on the field and not saying we're doing seven or 10% green and the rest we are doing like we did all time, because there we are taking poison on the field and 10% we are doing a little bit greening. That's not the real way. We have to change ag agriculture uh, as such. Well, let's take a short break right there. I'd like to watch a report all together with our viewers as well, of course. Luke Brown and Celine Schmidt have been out around Germany meeting farmers. They've been finding out not just how they've been coping uh, with the coronavirus crisis and all of those pressures, but also simultaneously trying to fulfil sustainability demands. Evil Barr doesn't like asking for help, but this year is different. With the aid of the younger members of his family, he filed a request for emergency funds from the German state post-Covid. It was a lifeline. At last, a bit of help from somewhere. Th that's good news. It'll pay our bills and the debt. Ivo has invested a million euros in his farm in recent years. The pandemic couldn't have come at a worse time. We have a loan to pay off over 25 years. And as farmers, we have to keep producing all the time, just to keep our head above water. In all, Ivo Bauer's farm received 9,000 euros in aid. That was just enough to cover the losses over a three-month period at the height of the European lockdown. 
Money alone won't save us, but psychologically, it is good for us to know that someone is thinking of us, even if it is just once, instead of forgetting us all the time. The EU and member states have shared the burden of aiding farmers during the crisis. Brussels permitting one-off payments of 5,000 euros per farmer, as well as increasing how much direct state aid governments were allowed to dole out and allowing the sector to store produce for longer to avoid flooding the market. But not everyone was so lucky. Hans Ott is also a dairy farmer. At first, he didn't qualify for aid. But once the price of milk collapsed in June, it was too late to file for help. By the end of 2020, the losses will have risen to €50,000 for the year. That's because the price of milk is too low. For Hans, the emergency aid was simply a sticking plaster over a much deeper problem. The price of milk was already barely enough to make ends meet. At the same time, farmers like Hans face another challenge, meeting the EU's targets of making agriculture across the continent greener. But amid the pressures of Covid, that's a step too far for Hans. This green policy during the Covid period, it won't be easy to achieve. If we receive political help, we can overcome this crisis. But if everyone just watches us, with business really suffering now, there will be bankruptcies. And if that's the case, then there's no way we can achieve the European Union's green objectives. The EU wants 25% of farms to be organic by 2030. With that in mind, the regional government in Baden-Württemberg pays a green bonus of €100 Euros per hectare for organic farmers. For the regional agriculture minister, Peter Hawke, COVID-19 has demonstrated the resilience of greener production. Organic agriculture actually did better during the crisis. I only hope that, when we come back to normal, that the success of organic endures. Because the customers that buy this organic produce, they add a great deal of value to the food. The new common agricultural policy is set to ring fence 20% of direct payments for green eco schemes. But with the overall budget set to shrink by over 30 billion euros, farmers will have to do more with less to ensure European agriculture really is greener. Anna de Varney Grunenberg, um, just looking at those issues for farmers right now with the coronavirus pandemic and these demands regarding sustainability, uh, a lot of farmers really seeming to feel like perhaps this is a little bit too much. A lot of people really feel like these sustainability demands could be perhaps eased off. Uh, but the time is running. That's a problem we all have. Is on the one side, of course, it's a lot of burden if we're not changing uh, the agriculture policy. So we have to change the, po the agriculture policy towards helping them who wants to change. Mm -hmm. Well, just regarding the bigger climate goals, there's a new goal to make farming climate neutral in the EU by 2035. That's pretty soon. Do you think that that's really realistic? We don't have any choice because uh, when the weather is being more dry and more hot, it's affecting the agriculture at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the sector has to change its own practice. And uh, I think uh, the science is giving us a lot of, uh, of ways to do it. Well, we're still in the Stuttgart area, but we've come to the Hohenheim University. Uh, I'm here in the company of agriculture and food policy professor, Dr. Christina Wieck. Thank you very much for joining yes, us. Hello. Hi. Yes, hello. So I'd like to just talk first about the COVID crisis itself and its impact on farmers. We've been looking at the fact that the EU gave a lot of flexibility to farmers in how they could do things, but there wasn't really any direct cash handed out. Uh, that was more done by the member states. Do you feel that the European Union itself could have done more to help farmers directly? I mean, there were issues definitely for the fruit and vegetable farmers, asparagus and then strawberries. Um, to get seasonal workers in. That was a big, big concern. But there, um, a lot of activities were started and a lot of self-help got initiated with online platforms and um, employees who had to cut short their normal jobs who went then into asparagus um, harvesting, which was a big challenge for the farmers. Overall, they managed to, to handle this challenge 
but I think now at the end of June, there were reports that quite a number of or amount of asparagus, for example, was lost due to this. And the German asparagus in spring is so important, as we yes. know. Yeah. Well, and one other aspect of the crisis that impacted on farmers, perhaps in a positive way, was to do with distribution of their goods. There's a report that I'd like us to watch together. Uh, now, German farmers have long complained that the big discount food stores and supermarkets push down their prices too far, that they can't make a fair income. During the crisis, however, farmers were more able to sell locally, directly from their farms sometimes. Luke Brown and Celine Schmidt have been to find out how this worked and whether it might continue on. 25 hectares of orchards in the hills above Mainz, an historic fruit-producing region in Western Germany. Theresa Pfeiffer's family has run the Kastanienhof farm for five generations. For her, 2020 has been a bountiful year, despite the pandemic, in fact, because of it. We are selling most of it local, so it's the market which increased this year by COVID. That we have more people to buy fruit at the, at the local market and they realize the importance of a local agriculture. For Teresa, direct sales to shoppers at the local market increased 20% and now represents 90% of her business. Cutting out the middleman has led to an increase in revenue of 15%, her goal for the farm is to rely solely on local sales. For the future, I only see two ways of growing fruits. The first is you get small and you sell 100% at the local market. And we will going to do that. But it's not possible for the bigger ones. They need to get the fruits sold at the central market and they need to get their prices. That trend is being repeated up the food chain too. Big discount supermarkets also promoting their local produce with the labels prominently on display. Here in this supermarket, at least 20% of the produce comes from local sources. In Germany, 85% of the food market is controlled by just four brands. And that means the relationship between farmer and retailer remains fraught, with producers the victim of a price war between shops to attract customers. And while eight out of 10 shoppers say they would prefer local produce, price remains the key factor. Our strategy is, of course, to consolidate this share of the market because we believe that it has potential. But in the end, it's what the customers want that's important. Are they going to continue looking for and buying these products? The success of local produce has been a long-awaited windfall for Wolfgang Hiss. He coined a local and organic label to cater to the booming customer demand. It helps him justify a higher price that customers are now willing to pay. The consumer demand for regional and organic produce has increased. Here in Freiburg, there's a movement of people who want carrots from the local region. Last winter, the Edeka supermarket chain bought our carrots. In fact, they wanted more than we could produce, so that allow us to name our price. The Farmers' Cooperative works hand-in-hand hand with Rinklin, a major organic wholesaler based in the region. Here, organic produce is shipped in from around the world, but Rinklin pays a 10% bonus to local producers. I am proud that we have a model that says it's OK if it costs a bit more, as long as the farmer has an environmental plan. Consumer demand is rising, we've seen that, but local products are still a niche market for us. German retailers have long held the upper hand in the battle over prices with farmers. But now, thanks to the global pandemic, parts of the agricultural sector can dream of a marketplace where they might get what they consider a fairer price. We're just coming back to our guest, Professor Dr. Christina Wieck. Uh, looking at that report, do you feel that it's likely that this phenomenon of people being able to buy locally, farmers selling more directly to their customers, is going to be able to continue? We have to keep in mind that direct sales or online delivery models are still a, mar a marginal sales um, point. But still, I think the local agriculture or the regional aspect of agriculture is something that came back to the minds of consumers. 
I'd like to look at that bigger theme of greening that we've been talking about in our programme. Auditors in France and at the European Union level uh, say that the efforts towards greening have been a disappointment and haven't worked out. I think on the farming side there has been a learning process. They start to realise they have to do more, but they also see it's costly. It impacts on their production, their way of production, and so <clears throat> they want to have ways how it's practical, how they can handle that. It feels like there's less money to go around thanks to all the cash being put into the COVID crisis. Uh, do you feel like farmers will be able to afford to make all these changes and keep farming the way that they are now? With respect to the climate, uh, they, have to, they have to change something because they also realise themselves that it's too dry. With respect to COVID, it's also there, you cannot get rid of COVID, you have to cope with it. And obviously they hope for a policy that, that supports them and that helps them to adjust to these changes. And in particular, we haven't talked about the international di dimension yet, but um, it's problematic if here in Europe the standards, the environmental standards go up and up, and then we allow imports to come in that, that do not fulfill the same standards. So that's, I think, where the policy has to adjust to these internal standards. Well, Professor Dr. Christina Wieck, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, my pleasure. And thanks to you for watching this first part of the programme. We will be continuing on in just a couple of minutes time. We're heading across the border back into France to compare and contrast how things are working out over there.